uh, various things that are going on in our life, these things are important. But they're not supposed to stand in the way of the Lord. Amen. They're not supposed to elevate themselves and put themselves in the position of the Lord in our life. Amen. Amen. And so that's what it said in Matthew 13 and 22. And, and in Matthew 13 and 24 through 25, he says this. Another parable he put forth, saying the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, what happened? The enemy came. The enemy came while the men were sleeping, and he sowed tares amongst the wheat. Matthew 26, 45 through 46. Then cometh he to his disciples. Now listen, I feel as though this is a prophetic word. Now, this verse of scripture right here, I'm just going to be real with you. I felt like the Lord that night, Friday night, this is one of the scriptures that I was reading. And I saw it in the light like I never saw it before. And I personally feel like this is a prophetic word for the church. Now, the thing of it is, is that the only church is going to hear it is the people that watch on video or you. But I want you to know that I believe that God is preparing his people for whatever is coming around the corner. Whatever that is. More Holy Spirit. More darkness. It don't matter how much darkness there's going to be because the light of God is more powerful than the darkness of evil. I do remember a story that I read whenever God sent Moses to deal with Pharaoh. And I remember the story that my God's snake ate up Pharaoh's snake. Amen? My God has power. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. All power has been placed in his authority and you and I have been given permission. Yes. Now he's called us to use his authority. Yes. Upon this earth, the Lord said he comes to his disciples. He says unto them, sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. <coughs> Behold, he is at hand. That has the truth. As I was reading that word right there, and I realized that this was the third time the Lord had dealt with the disciples and he said, can you not watch and pray for one hour? The Lord would speak to me, my friend, and so I will speak to you. The Lord has probably been asking many of us this question for quite some time. Can you not watch and pray for one hour? See, as Jesus is doing his business in the Garden of Gethsemane, getting the heart of the Father for what's about to be the most cataclysmic event that human history has ever known. When he will lay himself down as the Son of Man to right the wrongs of Adam. Where he will take his sinless life and offer it on the cross in order to purchase the souls of men back to God. His very disciples, called by his name, find himself with heavy eyes. Heavy eyes and heavy hearts because of maybe the cares of the world. Whatever it may be. But they're sleeping. And scripture after scripture warns us that these type of things happen to the very people of God. And then he says, and I tried another, sir, I tried another translation, and the King James gets it the best right here. He says, no, go on and take your rest. Go on and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man into the hands of sinners. I believe the prophetic aspect of this word is that God wants us to know that there will be a generation of believers. Whether or not it's going to be you, I don't know. I feel something in my spirit. Yeah. I don't know exactly what it is, but I feel like darkness is increasing every day. <coughs> and I want you to know that what we have to do a responsibility as the children of God is to stand with our Lord yes. and to watch <clears throat> and to pray and that we would not fall asleep. Help us, Lord, not to fall asleep. Yes. Help us, Lord, to not be resting when even your body is betrayed into the hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you 
for your goodness and your grace and your mercy, Lord. Have your way in our services, Lord. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Amen. Yes. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. I want to actually we're going to go ahead and read through verse four. I don't know that we'll get that far, but let's go ahead and let's start with First Peter one, verse one, and we'll go ahead and read through. It says, "Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers." Take note of that word, strangers, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Verse two, elect. Take notice of that word, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Amen. Go to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <coughs> to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, Lord. Thank you for your word. And then to remind us, to remind us of what this life is really all about. That word stranger there, if you look it up in the Greek language, the, the word that's used to describe it is pilgrim. You and I need to understand something. We, this place is not our home. We're, we're, we're foreigners yes. to this earth. That might be hard for you to understand. You might not be ready to believe what, I, what this preacher is trying to tell you. But I'm here to tell you, this place, if you're a believer today, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this earth is not your home. But Peter said it, the great Apostle Peter, the one that walked with the Lord, the one that we talked about on Wednesday night, that he saw the glory of Jesus shine on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's the one, I didn't even mention it, the Lord said, hey, go find a fish, there's going to be a coin in his mouth. What? The God of glory, the King of the universe. Yeah. Listen, go to go to John 18 and 36. I want you to see this. Man, the other night I was laying in my bed and I was reading this. And I think I'm going to preach a message on this, but I want you to see this. John 18 and 36. Let's start reading this. Look. He's talking to Pilate right here. Jesus is talking to Pilate right here. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. John 18 and 36. My kingdom is not of this world. He says, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. <laughs> it's okay, Pilate, you can kill me. You can listen to the crowd as they say, crucify him, because my kingdom is not of this world. He said, Pilate therefore says, aha, you are a king then. Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. And then some of the most powerful, I would actually say that this may be, I could be, spoken by a human being. The most powerful interrogative ever asked from a man. From conscious conscious lips. What is true? What is true? That's good. Jesus would say to Pilate, he who stands before you bears that name. <laughs> Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man. He is true. This king that is here is not our king. This is not the kingdom of our Christ. This is a temporary state of mind. When you got saved, the word of God says that you were translated from the kingdom of darkness 
into the kingdom of his dear son. This place is temporary. You are eternal. This place is not your home. You're a stranger. You are a pilgrim. And my question that I feel like God wants me to ask you this morning and ask myself as I preach, does something stand between you and God? I don't know your desire to see your child have a medical degree or some other type of degree, a desire for a husband, a wife, another child, a child. What is it? There's something there that's in the way that has your heart. God doesn't have your heart completely. Listen to me. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. You've got to figure it out if this is for you or not. Something has your heart. Something has a piece of your heart. God does not have the spot in your heart that belongs to him. And what I'm trying to say is, is that you and I need to recognize what that is. A preacher needs to recognize what that is. You need to recognize what that is. And you need to lay that thing down at the altar of the Lord. Because listen, if that thing is in your heart, if it's taking root, if it's festering, if it's living down deep into the deep recesses of your heart, it stands in the way of the presence of God moving in your life. And that's going to prevent the presence of the Lord moving through you into other people. This is a word of compassion and love from the king. He wants you to know that, hey, listen, there's something in our life. See, whatever it is, whatever it is, it has elevated itself above you. And like a cloud in the sky, it has positioned itself between you and God. In your mind, it's not a problem. But this thing, whatever it is, has positioned itself like a cloud between the sun and the earth. And it's casting a shadow onto you. And it's preventing the full grace and power of the Holy Spirit from pouring out on you. Preventing the very will of God and the fulfillment of His plan for your life. And it's preventing you from seeing God and His Word clearly. Distorting your spiritual discernment. Hindering your spiritual hearing frequencies. The signal is getting crossed and confused. And you don't know why. The presence of this thing has to go. Whatever it is, it's connected to this temporary world that we're living in. It might even be your gift. It might be your ministry. It might be your family. It might, listen, God is so concerned about your family. He's so concerned about your gift. He's so concerned about your ministry. But it is not supposed to elevate itself above you and stand between the grace of God being able to be poured out upon your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. It could even be something. Because see, listen, we're talking about strangers. Listen to me, Christian. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. See, that's one of the things I was talking about fasting earlier. One of the things connected to fasting, again, is that it removes me momentarily from this physical world. It, I recognize physical food is something that my body must have at some point in order to be able to be sustained. But I have enough faith to believe that if I will refrain from this, if I will remove myself from something physical, if I will remove myself from something earthly, I'm exhibiting faith and saying, God, you in my relationship with you, me being able to hear your voice from my life, me being able to access you is more important than this temporary food for this moment. At least. And Lord, as I come to you in prayer, I am believing that you're going to answer my prayers. I'm believing you're going to increase the anointing in my life. Not that I can earn it. No, you're not going to earn anything by skipping a couple of meals, my friend. What you're doing is that you're showing the Lord that this place is not your home. And that you're a stranger. And that you're recognized. And the reason I want to even talk about that kind of thing to you is because I believe as corporately as a body, if that's what we all agree that we want, more of the Holy Spirit. We're not earning it. Let me make it. Listen, I have spent the majority of my ministry that God has called me to coming against works-based ministry. I just, anybody that's sitting in this room that's been with us from the get-go, y'all know I have pounded works-based ministry. I have said, your prayer right is not what makes you righteous. Your coming to church is not what makes you righteous. Your fasting is not what makes you righteous. Reading your Bible is not what makes you righteous. But all those things are supposed to lead you to the one who has made you righteous. His name is Jesus. And the way he made you righteous was that he hung across and he shed his sinless blood. And now when you accepted that by faith, because that's your job, my friend, to accept it by faith now, 
righteousness has clothed you. Not the things you do, but we're to engage in these things, to let him know we want to hear his voice and we want to do his will. Anything, listen to me, anything that stands in the way of your good. See, it could be something like patriotism. Yes. Huh? It could be something like patriotism for the U.S. Or your current way of life. Come on, preacher. Don't be talking about stuff about shaking up my life, man. I like the way my life is. Come on, preacher. Don't be messing with the patriotism of this country. I was in the military. I was a foreign soldier. I fought for this country. Might be the way you like the way your life is right now. See, you may like your life so much. And God wants to speak, but you don't want to hear it. You want to hear what he's saying because, see, you don't like change. You think you don't need change. That's not true. We all need change. Yes. We all need to allow God to have more freedom in our lives. Yes. Every last one of us. Yes. That's right. The people that have left, the people that are in children's ministry, the people that are in the nursery, we all need to let God have more freedom. So is it, could it be our American lifestyle that's the problem? I'm just asking the questions. I didn't know who was going to be here. But I'm pretty sure that the majority of y'all like America. Your American mindset or your worldview, could that be standing in the way? Have you ever taken the time to think about the fact that your view of America and your life in this country could affect your interpretation of the scripture? Yes. I'm just asking Preach. the question. I'm not Preach. telling you that's what's happening. I'm very humbly just asking a simple question. Could it be possible could it be possible that your American mindset and your opinion of what you've grown up in could affect your biblical interpretation? That's between you and the Holy Spirit. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. God and finding out, is this preacher a cuckoo? Has he lost his mind? Does he not like the red, the, the, the red, white, and blue? Does he not like the star-spangled banner? Does he not like the freedoms and the liberties that have been given to him as a U.S. citizen? <clears throat> has he lost his mind? No, he has not. But he's asking me a simple question. Could it be true? Be careful not to cling too tightly to the flag, my friend. Yes. That's right. Be careful not to become so patriotic that you love being an American more than you love submitting to the Lord. In his word. Be careful that you don't love being American more than you love being a Christian. If that flag is standing between you and Jesus, you need to be respectful. You need to be respectful to the Holy Spirit. That's right. And you need to fold it up, sir. You need to fold it up the way that we were taught to fold it. If, listen to me, if the American flag and what it represents is standing between you and the Holy Spirit, you need to be respectful. And you need to fold it up. And you need to tuck it away. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Did, you, did, you think, did you just hear me and think that I told you that you need to move to Mexico? Because I didn't say that. No, no. Yeah. Did you just misunderstand me and think I told you to move to Singapore? I didn't say so. Or to the Caribbean? No, no, no. Don't let anything get to you. Right. And the presence of the Lord. Amen? So fold it up and tuck it out of the way. See, you need to see his eyes, sir. Man. Little guy. We need to see the eyes of Jesus. Because they're burning with fire. The eyes of the Lord are burning with fire because judgment is going to come upon this earth. <clears throat> judgment is going to come upon this earth. And listen to me, Christian. Judgment is going to come upon this nation. That's right. This nation is not going to escape the judgment of God. Because I'm here to tell you, this nation is not holy. It is not righteous. It is not true. This nation has fall, fallen into corruption. This nation has fallen into perversity. This nation was not founded exactly the way that we thought that it was founded. Has it provided liberty? Yes. Hallelujah. Has it provided freedom? Yes. Hallelujah. And don't tell me, brother, because listen, I was born and raised Catholic, 
so I'll talk about Catholicism. I was set free from alcohol, and I was made to go to AA meetings, so I will talk about AA. And I will say, it is not the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, yeah. and the life. And no man can see the And my daddy was a Marine, and he left some of his tainted blood on the frozen soil of Korea. And he raised me to be an American. And he raised me to be a patriot. And I'll talk about this country if I want to. And I will tell you what the Lord told me. You better not let that flag stand in the way of my truth. You better not let your ideals about this nation stand in the way of what I'm going to do on this earth. Because if you do, it's going to mess you up. Gonna mess you up. Yes, See, he's gonna use his bride, church. He's gonna wake up the church. He's gonna make her strong. He, he's gonna pour out his spirit. Yeah. And we have to make sure that there's nothing in our hearts, nothing in the way. We need to seek the face of God. I love this country. I turned 10 in Asia. I spent 40 days in Nairobi, Venezuela. I've been three times to Mexico and Gaudi. Virgin Islands, Jamaica, Holland, Norway. I swam in the Pacific. I swam in the Caribbean. I swam in the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic, and even the Red China Sea. I love seeing every one of those places. I was born an American. My dad again died for this country. I love this country. I love the ideals of this country. I love the ideal of less government. And let the people get out there and work. Let the people be productive. Let them earn a living. I believe in freedom. I believe in the freedom that Jesus brings. I believe in the freedom that this country gave opportunity for the gospel to go forward. That's right. That's right. But listen to me. The whole while, God's been sending the gospel out. Satanic magic. That's how I call it. You call it what you want to call it. Satanic magic has been nesting in the very heart of this nation. Yes. Satanic magic. It's, it, it's so obvious. If you can't see it, my friend, you ain't been looking. If you cannot see the satanic magic that has been nesting in this country and in the leadership of this country, then you don't want to look. That's right. It's there. It's high time that we no longer be blind, and it's high time that we wake up right. so that we don't get caught up. That's the lot of the language. Amen? Amen. Just as Peter gave this cryptic message to the church, he said it in 1 Peter 5, verse 13. Turn there. We're about to get into some prophecy on Sunday nights. We're about to unfold, I believe, from the Word of God what the beast is, the beast system, the beast. Look at this. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you, and so does Marcus. You know, if you read behind commentators and scholars, you will realize that there was no church known of in Babylon. There was no church in Babylon. Peter's talking about a place. But the name of the place is not Babylon. The name of the place is Rome. Peter's talking about Rome. And I'm here to tell you, Christian, the Lord's opening my eyes more and more prophecy. I believe it just be true. It may differ from some people that you have studied under, and that's fine. Hopefully we can continue to coexist together. But I'm here to tell you right now that the Lord is revealing that Rome was Babylon. It's always been a type of Babylon. It's the titular head of Babylon speaking spiritually. And we've been waiting because of Daniel chapter 9 for a revitalized Roman Empire. We don't need a revitalized Roman Empire, my friend. Rome never died. Now you go ahead and you hold on to that for a second. You hold on to that for a second. And you consider what I just said. I'm trying to tell you Rome never died. Rome is more powerful today than it's ever been. That's right. And it's tucked away in its own little city. And there it stands, sovereign, with an Egyptian obelisk outside the balcony of the Pope. <coughs> and every morning he arises, and I don't care what another man of God says, but that Pope, every morning when he looks, he sees the obelisk right there. 
I'm about to say that. And there's another city in the United States of America. And it's its own sovereign place. It's not even part. It's got its own laws. It's got its own protection. Vatican City, D.C. City. And amazingly, the capital looks just like the Vatican. And amazingly, the obelisk that the Pope looks like, there's also an obelisk that the president has. That's right. And then they see that image That's right. right there. How did it get there? Did it just show up? How, how did these things happen? How did Satanism start to nest in the midst of this country in such a way that it did? Is it? Can I do this? Can I say this? Is it Maryland? Or is it Maryland? Yeah. Is there something going on before our very eyes that we might be blind to? That's why I said all that stuff about America, my friend. Listen to me. Be careful. Don't let the nation that you love stand in the way between you and Jesus. Is there still a, is there still a remnant in this nation that loves Jesus? Hallelujah. Is there still a remnant in this nation that wants to yes. hold to Jesus more than yes. anything else? Yes. We better. We better. We better learn how to hold on to the Lord. We better not let that American mindset stand in the way. Oh, Lord, what does that mean? Are you, who are you saying Babylon is? We'll get into that more. It's going to take us a few weeks to unfold it, but we're going to get into it. All right. Let's go to verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Amen. We're going to go through the word of God here. He says, he elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. One of the things that I want you to know is this, is that that word elect, if you're going to look at it in Greek, the word is spelled like this. It's spelled eklektos. Eklektos. It's kind of got the idea of the election. You're the election of God. You're the elect of God. The idea needs to be chosen. When you go into a voting booth, what do you do? I choose this person to be president. And let me, while I'm saying that, <laughs> let me just say this. If he wins, I'm going to say, you ready? Go ahead. Prepare your ears. Make sure you don't have wax preventing <laughs> the sound waves to get your tympanic and brain and to vibrate and send the signal to your brain. If he wins in 2024, sleep with one eye open, my friend. I love a man that's ready to punch China in the mouth, especially when China is sitting and moves over our, our soils. That's right. I, I love a man that will tell, like my daddy would have told me, boy, when that bully asked you for your lunch money, you better pop him in your mouth, because if you give it to him on day one, you're going to be giving him everything. That's for right. Six I know. And if it was just that easy, I'd be so happy. But I know some things. I know some things that there's deception that's lying ahead. Am I saying that that is that? That is not what I'm saying right now. I'm telling you to keep one eye open. That's right. I'm telling you somebody's going to have some new words. I'm telling you somebody's going to bring deception. I'm telling you I have never seen the body of Christ look to one particular man and expect that that man whose name is not Jesus to bring rescue. I'm telling you right now, if you can't see the potential of a problem with that, just at least in our heart, just check your spirit is all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Will I be in the voting booth on that day? You yes. better believe yes. I will. And will I press that button? Yes. yes I sure would. <laughs> but did I get my point across? Yes. Just keep your eye open. That's all I'm asking. And I should be able to ask that. I should be able to say yes. that from behind this point. Yes. Understanding the word of God the way that I do, and understanding the deceptive nature of the serpent, yep. I should be able to say that. So please do that for me, okay? Amen. So, but you're the elect, you're the eclectos, you're the chosen ones. Chosen of who? Chosen of God. Chosen to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Chosen, hallelujah, that you are not to be part of this world. You're strangers and you're pilgrims to this temporary existence known as earth. And you, my, my friend, have now been translated into the kingdom of God. And you now are a citizen of the king of kings and the lord of lords. And your king told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And there were my disciples would not turn me over to you. No, his kingdom is yet to come. And it's going to come. And when it does, the Lord of glory is coming with it. Hallelujah. And they'll be riding on a white horse. 
sins is coming upon the earth. Thank God he took his ju our judgment, church. Yeah. Thank God he took the judgment of our sin upon his sinlessness. Thank God the great exchange took place. Thank God he took my guilt and gave his righteousness. Thank God that I don't have to face the judgment of Jesus. Thank God I don't have to face the wrath of the Lamb. That there's so many that are in the valley of decision and they're just they're just squandering and they're wandering. And, and the Lord wants to use people like you and I to pray for them and, and to reach out to them and tell them the good news of God. You're the elect. Hallelujah. You've been sanctified. What does it, what does it mean to be sanctified? It means to be set apart. I'm pretty sure that if you looked up the word in the Greek, you would find something like this. Something like a very apagios. You might find hagiasmas or something like that, but it would have this root in it. I'm sorry, hagias. It would have, that means holy. You've been sanctified. Jesus said it in John chapter 17. He said, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified. Sanctify them in your truth, O oh Lord, because it's your truth that sanctifies. Yeah. The truth of God sanctifies. What does that mean? The truth of God makes you different than the world around you, Christian. Yeah. The truth of God that has entered on the inside of your heart and has changed you is the one thing, that the only thing that makes you different. And when you put that truth in your heart, He sanctifies you. He moves you from the world. And He puts you in this Word right here. The living Word lives on the inside of you. And you now are different. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you're not sanctified. If you have not received the Lord of glory in your heart, if you have not bowed your knee to Jesus, then you are not the elect. The good news is that you can become the elect like right now while you're sitting in your chair. That's right. <laughs> I want my election to be sure, Lord. Yeah. I want to be a chosen one of them. I want to be one of your children. Right now, you can do it. You can say, yeah. Lord Jesus, and if I've been asleep, wake me up, Lord. Yes. Now, I started thinking sometimes when people come up to the front, I'm praying for them. I'm like, hey, man, let me explain to you a little bit about what we're about to do. I ain't doing that. The Lord, the Lord said, no, I'm going to, from now on, I say, well, what, what do you want from me, Lord? Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, you want to be a believer? Hey, look, let's do something for you. Let's do something for you. Let me get down here for you. Go ahead. Come on. Get down here. Get down here on your knee. Let's go ahead. Let's get down on our knee. Let's get down on our knees and let's bow our heart to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Count the cost, brother. Count the cost, yeah. Jesus himself said, no man begins to build a tower unless he first count the cost. People may ridicule you. People may laugh at you. People may scoff at you. They may mock at you. But just understand this ain't some little popcorn prayer. And we showed up one day to pray. Right. We need to question in our heart and in our mind whether or not we really want to belong to the Lord. And we ain't no way, no more monkey shine, no friend, ain't no more playing games. The question is, will we bow our knee to the King of Kings and the Lord? Hallelujah!
said, ooh, lucky we got a little meat because it's cold. Mm. Next thing I know, I'll wake up. I'm laid out on the cement. Wow. wow. They took me in. My, they did an EKG. My heart rate was 33. I was, I was gone. I could talk. But within a little while, a Canadian come to take me because Franklin couldn't do nothing for me. And when they're putting me on the stretcher, I told the lady, I was talking, and then I said, I feel so weird. I felt like they had a needle that had sucked every bit of life out of me. And I couldn't talk. I, I was so afraid. You know, I really was, because I like to say, I step right there to say, I, I couldn't. I wanted to. So I was transferred to New Iberia. Do I bury you? <laughs> I get there. And they say, I'm listening to everybody. Why did they bring her here? We have no ICU room for her. We don't have no cardiologist. Mm. We don't have no neurologist. Mm. Why is she here? Mm. Who popped his head around her? Oh. Oh. Just how it's gonna be. Wow. 
Well, I said, when, when Matt got through praying, I don't even know if he was still praying. I realized, I said, thank you, Jesus. Oh, and I said, I was talking. I'm not only walking, yeah. going to be talking, but I'm a talking, walking testimony. Yeah. And you know Every so often, boy, I could sure use some water. Scans every so often because your brain can start bleeding at any minute. If y'all can see the bruises on Wednesday night, I'm gonna make y'all y'all be able to see. It. But I'm gonna tell you, I said, y'all, one second. I said, y'all go ahead. Y'all do whatever test y'all gotta do. Because you ain't gonna find nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I had an MRI. I had two CAT scans. Yep. And then this lady walked out to the door, walks in, here to do electrocardiogram, and they want a balloon. Didn't matter. No, I don't know what it is. Hey, go ahead. <coughs> She's standing there doing it and crying. Because I'm talking with her. She said, I walked by this room so many times yesterday. Mm. And I knew you wouldn't go bank it. Mm. I knew it. Wow. I said, either way, I'm a winner. <laughs> but I said, I'll be here. Yeah. She's doing that little whatever she's doing, I'll just sound out there. I get another knock on the door. It's two women with a wheelchair. Like, what? They said, we're moving you to Second floor, room 253. <laughs> I've been through this in 21. The devil tried to take me out. He didn't get me. He didn't get me this time. <laughs> but I said, well, that means I'm going home. <laughs> and they said, see how you do, do tonight? I said, well, let the lady do what she got to do. You know, so she did it. I went on down. I ain't the doctor that came. Well, doctor came in with another doctor, and then after you left, little short doctor, he came in this morning. The one, the CIS doctor, is a little leery. He's not, you know, wants me to wear a heart monitor. I'm going to wear it. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. But anyway, the other little doctor that said, look, now you're going to have to be on this if you go home, which at that time, I'm like, you know, like, okay, okay. But I wasn't planning on taking nothing. nothing. <laughs> so anyway, he comes in this morning. Randall said, you said when he came. I ran to yeah. And he came in and he said, all, oh, all your tests come back. We can't see. Now they have proof. I have had a stroke. But yet all these other tests, he said, we don't see no sign of no stroke. Oh, Hallelujah! <laughs> and to, you know, give you right medicine, but this is all God. The nurse came in this morning, male nurse, wasn't very happy with me, because he walked in, he's got a little couple of pills, and he said, here with your medicine. I said, well, what you got? So I tell him, first one, and the uh, uh, neurologist was in the room, she had just come to tell me, Susan, we don't understand it. But every blood test and all came back. We've been doing blood tests every two hours. Your last blood test, all your levels are perfect. All right. Perfect. So he, first pill he wants to give me is for cholesterol. <laughs> she said, why do you want to give her a cholesterol pill when her levels are perfect? I said, I ain't taking that stuff. <laughs> but he wasn't happy. He said, you ain't going to take it? No, I have my meds from home and y'all saw to put away on dress, but ready to pick my clothes. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I did not take it. And then the CIS doctor came, and, which is really don't understand, you know, but we'd like you to wear a heart monitor, we'd like you to have a stress test, 
And let me tell you, when that doctor walked in there this morning, I already had my pants on <laughs> and my shoes on. And he said, well, you can go in. You can just take that heart monitor off yourself. He said, go in. He said, go in, get dressed, go on. He said, all you got to do is sign your paper. And let me tell you, Miranda, I'm so glad it was God with you. I've been texting Shelby all the way. And I said, we left the hospital, what, it took maybe 15 minutes to get here. <laughs> no, no. I said, we're, we're speeding. She always said, don't get a ticket. I'm not driving. I said, God is helping Randall. And I was praying, God, just keep the cops out of the way. <laughs> Many, many years. Okay? Yes. And let me tell you, that's a powerful man yes. of God right there. Yes. But other than what y'all, I really, I really, really thought when I got on that stretch, it's like, you know, we all get the time. It's like, okay, God, I'm ready. Yes. But he wasn't finished. And I I got some people coming in here Wednesday night. Yes, ma'am. Full fledged cat. Let me tell you, like, Come on now. believers have now, you gone. Are you going to be preaching to us? Are you going to be giving us Yes. Amen. 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 Yeah. I love you. <laughs> I love you because he, he called this morning and I'm sitting there. I'm at the hospital. I'm watching the clock and it's like, Lord, if you don't do something, ain't no way I'm going to make it today. But I guess I have to wait till my answer. <laughs> but I had to share this with y'all. Hey, you know, if you have any doubt, any doubt. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Because I want us to be able to also give a special offering for Gowdy, okay? If you feel led, you don't have to. But Gowdy's going to be going back to Mexico and it's sooner than what we expected because God's doing a lot of things over there. So if you can give extra, fine. I'm just letting you know right now that the church is going to give him an offering. But I also want to give you an opportunity to be able to give to this ministry. I'm telling you right now, God's doing some amazing things in Mexico. And, I'm, and this is an opportunity for you to receive a blessing from the Lord. That's how I see it. And there's an empty basket right there. And we're about to worship the Lord. And we're about to give it glory. Hallelujah. We're about to contain the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 